Somebody has anonymously dropped us 40 page research file documenting flooding gays plagiarism. Christopher Rufo. Chris Rufo. Chris Rufo. Christopher Rufo. Chris Rufo. We're really excited to be joined today by Christopher Rufo. Universities used to be a home to produce scholarship in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful. Oh, yeah. the chief troublemaker, and I love it. You know, it's funny when I was um, preparing to just chat with you, I was looking up all kinds of hate articles about you, right? Oh, all nice. the hit pieces. Yeah. But what is amazing is I anticipated that I'd find each article to say something different about you, you know, racist or, you know, white, you know, right wing extremist, whatever. Literally every article about you is the same article. They change the title, but it's the same thing. It's, it's like there's a robot that just takes the words and doesn't even, it's like complete plagiarism. It's amazing. Yeah. And, and, and it's actually interesting. I don't get the typical smears. The big, the big one is that I'm a you know, right wing or conservative propagandist, yeah. um, which I find to be an amazing um, smear because one is I'm, I'm propagating the truth. I'm getting the truth out there. But it's like, you know, propaganda is usually something that a state, a nation state does, a large institution does. I run a tiny operation with like two or three people. <laughs> <laughs> and so the fact that I'm like big, scary propagandist that's threatening to disturb the status quo from such a small position, it's actually like a, a kind of an unintentional compliment. Right. So I, like I, right. Look, if that's my bad rap, I'll take it. That's you fine know what? It's a yeah. it's a crack in the system that they're not willing yeah. to take because they know that the cracks will create the pressure and they will allow no dissent. And so they yeah. have to squash you as fast as possible. Yeah. What is, I mean, I think one of the things that really put you on the map recently is your exposure of Claudine Gay, the president of, of Harvard, and her plagiarism. And I've been really dying to ask you, yeah. how did you, how did you find that? Yeah, I mean, it, in, in a sense, it found me. Uh, obviously, this was a huge story following the Hamas terror attacks uh, on October 7th. Claudine Gay was in the news because she was telling, she told Congress that calling for the genocide of Jews might not violate Harvard's policies, depending on the context, which is like, um, you know, kind of a PR nightmare. But, and I had written a little bit about it. I was trying to tell people, this is the connection between decolonization ideology, DEI, and then the pro-Hamas faction on campuses. So I was trying to connect the dots for people. And as I was doing that reporting, which was kind of um, mostly explanatory or analytical, actually got an email from a colleague who got it from an anonymous source, said, you need to check this out. Somebody has anonymously dropped us the full research file, document, like 40 page research file documenting Claudine Gay's plagiarism. I still to this day don't know who sent it, under what motivation, don't know anything about it. But the great thing about that kind of material is it's easily verifiable. So I said, all right, well, I'll buy all the papers, check to make sure that these people are portraying it accurately, verify that, that it's true. Um, and then once we verified it, you know, authenticated the, the claims, um, I knew it was gonna be explosive because yeah. you have the president of the world's most prestigious academic institution predicated her entire career on academic fraud. And so I knew that that was gonna take this whole scandal to the next level and uh, sure enough it did. Do people know to send in emails when they discover things to you? I'm like, where do they go? Do you go to your website? I'm not sure I even knew that I can give you tips. Oh, on you should. Oh you my should God, get, I'm going to start blowing give you up you tips. Yeah, yeah. It's just Chris Rufo at Proton Mail. It's a secure email drop. Um, people know. I should probably you know promote it even more. When I do big reported series, I usually promote. You know, here's the tip line. Here's the the the, the place to send me send me materials. And so I've developed a lot of sources around the country on various reporting projects. Um, and I think this one came in likely because I was reporting on this. So I was doing higher education reform. I was doing the work here in, in, in Florida at New College. I was writing about abolishing DEI. And so I think that this uh, whistleblower or leaker, whatever you want to call this person, I suspect it's an academic, just kind of have that feeling hmm. intuitively from the document. Also, like, who's going to be checking plagiarism documents? Who knows how to do that? But I think they said, all right, this is a person who could take this information and turn it into a big deal. Wow. And so whoever you are, thank you. I know. Yeah. Well, thank you on behalf of America, right? Yeah. And probably yeah. Western civilization in I, general. I, I think you. she would still be president if it were not for the plagiarism scandal. Oh, for sure. Yeah.
for the, sure. like calling for the genocide of of of, of Jews uh, or or you know kind of rationalizing calls for the genocide. She didn't call for genocide, obviously, but she kind of rationalized it, excused it, drew circles around it. You know, kind that's of sad. Okay. It, that's I mean, okay. it's kind of sad that like that's not enough. You yeah. know, that's how far things are gone. It's like just unbelievable. It's a, it's a sad state, but I think that, look, we put one victory up and uh, hopefully more to come. Well, you obviously woke up a lot of people to the dangers of DEI. And then yeah. most recently you had another huge victory, which I don't want to just ignore. And that's what you did here at the University of Florida, right? Where you got them to fire everybody that works for the DEI department. How did that, can you just give me yeah. the background on that? I mean, there must be a story behind that. Yeah, that's too, a right? long time coming, but you know, at, basically at the beginning of last year, um, I had model legislation, uh, uh, you know, worked on model legislation. I worked with the governor's, uh, Governor DeSantis's team here in Florida. I did investigative reporting series of five, exposing DEI at five Florida public universities. Um, launched this campaign at this great event with Governor DeSantis. Um, you know, helped, you know, get this legislation through to abolish all of the DEI offices in all of Florida's public universities. And so fast forward, because these things take time, they're administrative procedures. Um, you know, these DEI offices start disappearing at campuses. And then finally at University of Florida that had, that was spending $5 million on DEI programs per year. Um, you know, they, the, President Sass over there did, did the right thing, complied with the law, obviously. But he made it very simple. He said, all the DEI employees, are, are their employment is terminated. They can apply for other jobs. They may or may not get them. Um, but we're going to follow the law. We're gonna, and then we're going to spend that $5 million recruiting all-star faculty from around the country. And so, a very simple thing. Do you want to have left-wing DEI bureaucrats you know, poisoning campus culture? Or do you want to spend that money recruiting the next great academic or scientist or philosopher hmm. um, and bringing them to the state of Florida? And so I think that, I mean, I, I, I'm you know, not shy to take credit, but really the credit belongs in the governor's office. Uh, the governor himself you know, took, the, took the lead on this issue. Um, and now other states are following suit. Do you think this can also happen in other colleges in Florida? Well, it's happened in every college in, in Florida's public universities. Right. There are no more DEI departments anywhere in the state of Florida right. in the public universities. Private universities can do what they Whatever wish. They want. But here's the thing. If we're setting the expectation, we're setting the precedent that you don't have to have this. Actually, it's better not to have this. You can save money. You can improve campus culture. You can have a greater variety of viewpoints. You can comply with civil rights law. You know, that's something that universities should do. Um, by, by, by abolishing DEI, I think we're going to start seeing private universities follow suit. And we've already seen many corporations, especially in high tech, the last six months, companies that you wouldn't even expect, um, you know, left-wing Silicon Valley companies, um, trimming their DEI departments by as much as 90%. And so that's a story that hasn't been, hasn't been told publicly to, to a huge degree. Um, but to me, that's a sign where people are saying, mm, we tried this. Maybe people had good intentions. Uh, it doesn't work in practice. Let's just treat everyone equally and try something else. Yeah, hopefully it goes into what I call into the bloodstream, right? So it's not just yes. the top down and they don't exist. But you know, the, the student body, the parents who are sending their kids to those schools will start realizing that they don't want to waste money on you know, teams that actually backfire on them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you could do cool programs for students. You could cut tuition. You could do mm -hmm. all sorts of things uh, with that money because at the end of the day, anyone who runs a budget, you run a big budget for, for Prager U. You guys have been very successful. But look, there's always limited. Yeah. You, you know, you can spend it on this or this. There's always trade-offs. There's always limits. You always have to find out. A, a responsible executive says, what's the best use of this? And I think it's getting harder and harder to say the best use of money is to put it into DEI. Right. I don't think anyone believes that anymore. I'm curious, one last question, and I don't know if you've thought about this, but sometimes for me at PragerU, I feel like there is this pressure on constantly doing the impossible, constantly delivering miracles, right? It's like we started with the five minute videos and all the millions of views, and then we did the documentaries, and then we made PragerU Kids in Schools, and then we made it into the schools, and it's like, People are just constantly expecting us to do the impossible. And I'm expecting my staff to always do the impossible. And so it's 13 years of doing the impossible. 
Do you hear what I'm what I'm saying? To totally, is, is yeah. Is there that kind of pressure on you too? I feel like it's like, okay, Chris, what's the next miracle that you're going to deliver to <laughs> yeah. America? All right. It is, yeah, for, for for sure. Yeah, there's expectation, and especially when you do something very successful, you're always feeling, like, oof. Okay, I got to find out the next thing. What am I going to do? And um, th there is a bit of a kind of background anxiety, pressure, expectation. That's probably good. You know, that's what yeah. drives you to succeed. That's what you know. That's what makes you try try to stretch, and 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 I know that for for what you guys are doing, you've accelerated. It's not just oh you've done a bunch of different things. I think from even what I've you know last few years that I've been working with you and, and getting to know you and the organization, you guys are doing new things at an accelerating pace, also not just scale. And so I think that's good. Look, we're, we're, it's not like we can be complacent. We can't just relax right now. We got we got to hustle and. And at the end of the day, I think even on a personal level, yes, there is expectation. Yes, there's some anxiety. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta reach new heights. But then you kind of have to just follow your instincts, figure out what's engaging your curiosity, and, and figure out what you're doing that's fun. Um, and I've noticed that projects that I do that are not fun, that are not kind of driven by curiosity, that have some, you know poor motive that, you know, whatever, like not quite, not quite the right fit. Those are the projects that for me, like don't quite work. But when I'm having fun, when I'm fully engaged, even if I don't set out to make something out of it, those mm -hmm. se seem to be the things that are, are the most successful. I think people are wondering what are the things that they can invest in in order to help repair America. I think people are starting to realize that they should look at their philanthropic investments in a similar way that they would look into their financial investments. You yeah. want to invest in winners. And so I know that our relationship started many years ago when both of us were, were small operations yeah. and both of us were, you know, shooting for miracles, right? Yeah. We had these moonshot ideas and it's just so amazing to sit here with you. I think from, from a certain standpoint, you've been one of PragerU's investments. We were yeah, like, that sure. guy, yeah. that guy is special. And I just, I, I completely would double down on that. And I think that yeah. anybody that has supported you uh, from the get-go is probably just feeling so proud and so excited yeah. and just rooting for you. And it's, it's so fun for me to sit with you and say, I knew you when, because to yeah. me now yeah. you're like, oh, yeah. the chief troublemaker. Oh God, and yeah. I love it. So. It's great. Yeah. I, I think you're right. And, um, and I'm grateful for all the support that I got early on from you, from a lot of other people. And I think that we all have to be, uh, just like an investor would think great investors realize the principle of, power law distribution or, you know, high risk, high reward. And so philanthropists and investors and people who've been successful have to carry that same risk taking spirit, that same um, ambitious spirit. It's not just give to your alma mater, give to the opera, you know, give to the, to the, to the YMCA. Alma mater, don't do it. Okay. Opera, maybe do it. YMCA. Yeah, probably good. Um, but actually be more creative and, and, and take that same approach that you had in, in business life to your, to your philanthropic life and invest in things where people are driving results that are undeniable. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff in our world where great presentations, a nice sales pitch, but then you're kind of like, yeah, but what is it tangibly that has been accomplished? And then, you know, with, with, with Prager, with, with, you know, I hope with what I'm doing as well, we can say very clearly, this is what we've done. This is what we've accomplished. We're actually moving the ball forward on, in this way. Um, and we, we, we have to demand that. And, yeah. and I even tell my, my, because I have a very small budget, um, uh, I, tell my, I tell my folks you know, who, who, who support me, I say, look at all your philanthropic contributions and tell me, like, who, and I want to know if I'm, if I'm not number one on per dollar impact, like, don't give me any money. Like, yeah. What? I completely you see, you, agree. You know, Hold it, us accountable. Please. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like if I'm not delivering, if, if you have other investments where you're saying, okay, for how much money I'm putting in, I'm getting X kind of return on it. Make sure that I'm there. Like, I don't want you to make me lazy either. Right. I want to be able to show you next year when we meet again, like, this is what we did. I'm excited to tell you. And I'm not going to have to BS you because... Right. Because you know you, you're aware of the impact, and I mean that's kind of what you guys do as well yeah. in, your, in your pitches. Yeah, I love that. Well, it's great. It's so great to serve alongside you. Thank you, Chris. Likewise. Thank, Thank you. you.